signs and wonders. Absolute grace. Complete freedom. A place of no condemnation. Zoe Ministries. Where we dare to believe. Say praise the year. Come all your AGS owns and follies. Yeah. I never forget many years ago we were having a, a prayer meeting and uh, we were praying for our pastor who was about to go on television and go on a debate show. And uh, I was responsible for the prayer those years. And I remember a lot of people from around the country came to pray. It was a big, it was quite a large, large issue. And uh, this gentleman came in, quite a large gentleman, and he came in, he was very loud. And uh, he could pray down a storm, literally. And I remember little old me went up to him and I said to him, Um, the year doesn't do with me. God's not deaf. You don't have to shout so loud. And unfortunately, he took offense. And, and he left. But I've learned since then a little bit of wisdom. If a guy wants to shout, let him shout, man. You know, he's worshiping God, he's praising God, he's not praising some dead idol or some dead God somewhere. So we must learn not to, not to criticize the body of Christ. I said from the early 80s already, I said, said to the people I had influence over, I said, never, never criticize another church. Whether it's a Catholic church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, a RGS, a NG church, a, a Salvation Army, it doesn't matter what it is, don't criticize those people. They're doing the best they know to do. They've, they've obeyed God in their call. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and not only that, as uh, Pastor Andre was saying, you sow stuff. Because if you start sowing into another man of God bad seeds, you're going to reap a harvest of bad, bad harvest. And so it's wise to zip the lip, not talk about men of God, women of God, and discuss them Rather pray for them. I found that with my wife, because you know, whenever I don't have agreement with my wife, which is very rare, because she gets me into agreement. <laughs> but when I do, I always go before God and say, Father, the woman you gave me. And that's not quite true. You know, we choose our spouses. God doesn't give you your husband or wife. You choose your husband or wife. And so your husband that you have today, it was your choice, my dear. Okay. And so for choosing your wife, guys, you chose her. Don't complain. You've got to understand then when, you, when you're married over 40 years, gravity does play its part. All right. So that nice, good-looking chick that you married, she doesn't look like a chick anymore. All right. But you still love her. I've, I've had the privilege of being married to my wife. Uh, we're going 41 years now this year coming. And so I'm highly privileged to be married to a woman of substance. And um, we've learned through the years to learn to agree. Even if you disagree. Act with the bosses. Say boss. She's the boss. And uh, we've got a good understanding. It, it's uncanny sometimes because women know your thoughts. Your wife I'm talking about. I mean, you're driving the car and she knows exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. It can be scary, you know. I mean, I go and spend time praying and, and trusting God and, you know, weeks later I get, get this great revelation and I come to say to her and I say, uh, you know what God showed me? She says, yeah, but I already knew that. So I said, how do you know that? She says, no, I just knew that. See, she's a knower. I'm a seer. But I take sometimes a long time to clean the windscreens. To see properly. <laughs> yeah. How many of you know that God knows your frame? God knows who you are. Mm -hmm. What's your name again? Johan? Johan, no dear. You're just living over. God is awesomely in love with you. He loves you so much. Uh, I just see you. See, the wheels are spinning. And the season that you're in right now, you need, you need to know where your season is. 
And the Lord showed me your season is preparation right now. And you're trying to get far ahead of the season that you're in. God's season, not your season, God's season. And so your time, your time is a preparation of the soil. And then get the seed in there. And then pray for rain. Because that's what a farmer does. Once he's prepared the ground, he doesn't ask for a harvest. He asks for rain. Because he knows when the rain comes on his seed, he's got a, a harvest. And so the Lord just quickened that to me early on in, in praise and worship. And um, I mustn't forget because there was something else there. Is this all right if I just share that quickly? All right. I just wanted to get that right. If I can get this computer to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, hey, I tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord, where is it? These things go missing. All right. Let's go one back. How do I go one back? Yeah, one back. Come on, come back. Oh, yeah. Would you write down Psalm 139, please? That's yours. It's an awesome, it's an awesome word of the love of God for you. And you will understand after you read the psalm how much God loves you because he knows your frame. Because the psalmist talks about God knowing your, your inner being. And I just want to encourage you with that, okay? That Psalm 139 is for you tonight. And has ever, anyone ever prophesied over you about the prophet's call? Okay. There you have it. It's enough for you. Amen? Amen? You're called as a prophet, and you need to just understand that. And the journey of the prophet is not an easy journey. It's a long journey. It's a tough journey. But it's worth it. Believe me. I knew 1982, God called me as a prophet. I couldn't spell the word. I thought you spelled it with an F. <laughs> it took me years to discover that I am a prophet. I'm born a prophet. Not made a prophet. Not desiring to be a prophet. But that took years. 30, 30 odd years down the road, I came to the, the understanding, like gave David, King David got the perception, I'm king. And he was serving as king for some time. And he said to his men, he said, you know what, guys, I'm king. And they said, yeah, but of course you're king. You see, many people see the prophet, but you don't even see it yourself. And there comes a day that suddenly you just realize, I know who I am. And what it does for you, it takes pressure off your shoulders. You don't have to try and be anybody. And the prophet doesn't have to stand behind a pulpit, by the way. Okay? The prophet can be in the sporting field. The prophet can be in the business field. The prophet can be anywhere in the marketplace. Okay? But just know God's call on your life. So I hope that's confirmation for you tonight. Okay? Good. Praise God. Nice to come to church. I wish someone prophesied over me like that. I was telling uh, Pastor Yonan the other day, I said, I waited 20 years for a prophet to prophesy over me. And I sat in the front rows of large congregations. And the best of the best came into our church around the world. They'd spit on you, walk over you, bump over you to prophesy over other people, but nothing to me. And then one day, Kim Clement, if you know who Kim is, Kim comes up to me and he punches me in the stomach. He says, keep on praying, my brother. My first prophecy from a, from a prophet of God. And you might say, well, what great, what word was that? I mean, come on, you know. Was it a true word from God? Yes, because right then at that time, the season in my life is I was responsible for the intercession of a large church. And just that word, keep on praying, means I'm in the right place doing the right thing. You guys love to pray. Is your brother good? Who come near? He's lay. Okay, die Heer het my gewees al twee van julle, op julle knieën, en hoe julle bid. En die ding van al die damekies op die beach. Yeah. Forget about that life. God showed that to me. God showed me that way, where you guys are looking at is, life isn't all about sunshine and roses and the nice beach situations. It's cool, it's lekker, there's a, there's a, there's a time for that. Maar ek sien hoe die Heer julle gaan invat. 
vir die seisoen van gebed. Ontvang het net. Dit is een prachtige woord daar. Because out of prayer comes destiny. Okay? Most Christians don't pray. Don't want to pray. You need to stop word. Maar jy weet jy moet. <laughs> Hallo. Okay. But as you hear, you almost all your words are this. Yeah, it's cold. Okay. I'm trying to get to the word, man. Come on, I want to preach the word tonight. Okay. I just want to preach the word. I want to get, get the stuff running here. I just love the word. I love to teach the word. I, I love to fall in love with the word. You know, do you know that there's things in your hearts that you don't even know is there? I wrote my first article. Oh, let me say this to you. My five years in matric were the worst years of my life. <clears throat> my English teacher said I would never make it in life because my handwriting is worse than a crab that's jumped into an ink pot and got onto the piece of paper. Now, most of you don't know what an ink pot is. You all got your fancy stylus pens now today. But I remember that Radio Pulpit asked me to do an article for them. And I did an article for them, wrote an article. And I got some responses, and especially one professor gave his comment, and his comment was, you write the biggest lot of rubbish. You know nothing about spiritual things. You're basically, you're an idiot. Now what that did to my spirit man is, my spirit man dropped into my boots and I said, I'm never going to write. A year or so later, two years later, certain publishers contacted me and said, James, may we use your articles that you wrote for our, I don't know if it's their 50th or 100th commemoration or whatever they had. We see you as one of the, the better Writers, we like your articles. Can we use your material? Two years later. I never knew that I had books inside of me. I've written, I don't know how many books now. The latest one is that one on Holy Spirit. And there are much more books in here. My English is atrocious. Hello. Hello. Ek sê boerkie, nie, ek sê eindelijk nie boerkie, ek sê Engelsman wat mak gemaakt is. In myself, my English doesn't make sense. And yet God has enabled me to write books that have gone around the world, reaching thousands and thousands of people. I'm sharing that because I want you to know there's stuff in you. Because I'm here tonight, as a prophet of God, the anointing on my life will quicken that and release it for you. Whether it is that you are to be the best sportsman or artisan or whatever, God's going to quicken that. I just sense that in my, in my heart. You've got to understand when God brings a gift to the body of Christ, He wants to always leave a deposit. He leaves something behind. There's an anointing that gets left behind in this place for miracles. Your pastor operates in, in the office of the apostle prophet. That's why many times it doesn't make sense. Hello? Because prophets operate differently to the teacher. But combined with what he and his wife have got, she's the prophetic one. She's called on the, with the prophetic mantle. God deposits something for them. And like he came to my church and pre uh, preached in my church, he left something behind there. A good aroma. So tonight, I leave a good aroma behind. Amen. Amen. Turn with me please to Genesis chapter 5. I want to talk tonight, and I'm trusting God that Holy Spirit will give you revelation. You've got to get this morning's teaching. Because it leads up to where I'm going to tonight. Would you say after me, revelation? revelation. Say insight. insight. Say understanding. Insight. Say supernatural. Yeah. Say natural. natural. Supernatural. supernatural. You can determine where you want to live. 
Do you want to more in the natural or do you want to live more in the supernatural? It is your choice. And quite frankly, the supernatural is not complicated. The supernatural is the realm that you seemingly can't touch. It's invisible. Do you know that words are invisible? Faith is the substance of those things that we cannot see. Words you cannot see. But sound comes out of the same spectrum as light. Light you can see. The smaller, smallest particle known to man is frozen sound waves. When God spoke into the atmosphere, sound waves went out, which is in the same wavelength as light. God is light. So you can think on that for a while. So everything resonates, has sound, because that's what our, our science class tells us. Nothing can be destroyed, no matter can be destroyed, but matter has got memory, matter absorbs sound. Hello. I mean, that's not, it's, 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 you can go and Google it anywhere. And you find, that's what the scientists are telling us. That the, the, the universe, they've, they've recorded sound in the outer universe. Sound out of rocks. Are you there? What is that? That's simply God had spoken into it. Words are important. Supernatural is not so complicated. You find out tonight that the supernatural is actually quite easy. Say, so I, I want it. That's what I want to do. I want to, I want to create a hunger in all of us. And I prayed that early on. I said, Father, put a hunger and a thirst in us for the supernatural. Because that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be supernatural beings. Put the hunger in us because God won't meet that need if you're not desiring it. So my prayer is that you'd be really stirred up after tonight and say, Oh God, please give me more. In Genesis 5, 21, I'm just going to read from 21 to 24. When Enoch was 65 years old, Methuselah was born. Now, Methuselah was the oldest living human being at that time. He almost reached perfection. Perfection being a thousand years. Adam's, Adam's offspring, none of them ever got a thousand. God wanted him to reach a thousand, which meant eternal life, long life, everlasting life. But because of the sin, no one ever obtained perfection there. But the good news is that God has provided for us for perfection, Amen. that we can get there. And you're going to see this. Verse 22 says, Enoch walked, and this is the Amplified Bible, Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God. And I want you to hear this. Enoch walked in constant fellowship, habitual fellowship with God. God never walked with Enoch. Enoch walked with God. He hooked himself in with God and he walked with God after Methuselah was born. That's his son. For 300 years, he walked with God. Hmm. Didn't backslide. Whew. That tells me a story. You know, we read the scripture, and if you, if you just read it just quickly, uh, you know, uh, and Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. God took him. But we, we don't realize that for three Hundred years, he walked habitually with a, in a personal relationship with God. Remember, Adam had the same privilege. Enoch was his offspring, one of his offspring. So don't you think Adam, his daddy, or great, 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 I think he was the seventh generation, don't you think that he learned something from Adam? Must have. He must have gave, given him some information over those four gener or seven generations. So this guy, he walks with God, not in a casual relationship. It's like this young couple decides to get married. And the pastor marries them and they kiss 
And they say that th question thing. And then he says, my love, I need to go to Europe because I've been called to Europe. My business is there. I'm off to Europe. And she says, well, I'm to stay here in South Africa because I'm a South African. This is, I'm a native of this, of this country. And this is where I'm to stay. And so for the next 40 years, they live in that kind of situation. He's in Europe, and she's down here in South Africa. They are married. But they don't have close fellowship. They never had the privilege of creating another human being duplicating themselves or triplicating themselves, multiplying themselves. But they married. Many are like that in the church. They married to Christ, but they don't have intimacy. True? Van bed en tafel geskei. There's marriages, many marriages like that today. They married, but she still makes his coffee, makes his food, but they don't sleep in the same bed. They don't have intimacy. They've got separate rooms maybe or even separate beds. It's a sad story. Shouldn't be like that. Amen? Say amen. amen. Or say ouch, one of the two. <laughs> when you're in the ministry, you see a lot of that. They married for a long time, but for the children's sake, we'll stay together, but I hate your guts can't stand you anymore, you know, the love of your life, and the whole thing started because of something very stupid a long time ago, one of the two of you got offended, took that offense, my, my late dad took offense because of a minister, my dad came out of the second world war, and a minister said stuff that he shouldn't have said. It was more politics that he spoke than what he spoke the word of God. My dad had come out of a war where many of his friends had died in front of him. He wanted the man of God to pray for his soul. He needed peace in his soul. They'd killed people. Hello. And the man of God spoke politics. As a result, my dad got offended, never went to church ever, except for funerals and weddings. An embittered man. But thank God he got saved and got born again. I was instrumental in that. And I thank God for that. But for I don't know how many years, him and my mom stayed in the same house, but lived separate lives. Not nice. What does God feel like? What does Holy Spirit feel like when he's coming to the heart of man to live there, to fellowship, and no one talks to him? He ignores him does exactly what the flesh wants to do, but doesn't listen to the spirit, d doesn't live the spirit life, lives the flesh kind of life, like I spoke of this morning. What does God feel like about that? Hmm? Not nice. Verse 23 says, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God. And he was not, for God took him home with him. After 300 years of walking with this kid, God says, I like you, man. Come home with me. I want to bring it into a, a practical context where we're living today. You are not born to go to heaven. You are born to be on the earth. If death is the one that releases you from sickness, from pain, disease, and suffering, then death has become your savior into the new life. Not Jesus. Jesus said, I come to give you life. I didn't come to give you death so you can go to heaven. Come, this might shock a lot of people. If death has taken someone off of the planet, they're not a earthling anymore, they become a heavenite. 
A heaven knight is a spirit being. Being is a triune being that is spirit, soul, and body. Separate any one of those out of that relationship and you find you'll end up in heaven. Or the heavenly realm, whether you're saved or unsaved, you either go down or you go up somewhere. You either go to the hot place or you go to the cool place. Okay. Your choice. But Enoch's habitual fellowship with God impressed God so much that he said, you know what? I want you with me. This youngster of 365 years of age didn't have to go to the grave, wait for thousands of years for the, after the flood and then the Jews and then Jesus and then the resurrection. He was just like there instantly. Hebrews 11.5 says something about Enoch. Listen to this. Because of faith, say to me, because of faith. Because of faith, Enoch was caught up and he was transferred to heaven. Because of having faith in God, he was caught up into the spirit realm. Because of your faith in God, you have the potential of being caught up into the realm of the Spirit and see the things in the Spirit. See, discerning of spirits does that. The gift of discerning of spirits does that. When someone sees Jesus in physical form or angels or, or demons, it is the gift of discerning of spirits that does that. It opens up, it removes the veil that you can look into or step into that realm. Now, Enoch had this awesome fellowship with God, and so the veil was removed for him. He stepped into another realm, but he never came back. He stayed there. Many of you at the sound of my voice have entered into this realm every now and then. But there's much more. Say much more. Come on, I want to I I whet your appetite tonight. Because of faith, Enoch was caught up, transferred to heaven so that he did not have a glimpse of death. How many of you like that? And he was not found because God had translated him. Took a name, what's translation? When you are translated from one place to another geographically, like Philip the evangelist, he was preaching to the eunuch there at the water, and the next moment, the eunuch turns around, Where, where's the guy that baptized me? 30 miles down the road in Azotus, Philip's preaching. The prophets had the same kind of experience. They looked for the prophet, they couldn't find him because God would transport them from one mountaintop to the next mountaintop. When the king wanted to kill the prophet, they said, no, but you're going to disappear, you know. Not folklore, not stories, Reality. I remember I was in the United States one year, and uh, we were traveling down a very narrow road, doing 70 miles per hour in a vehicle that was towing a large trailer behind, and uh, it's, it was raining, five o'clock traffic, doing 70 kilometers per hour in these this narrow little roads, and I had the unction from Holy Spirit to pray, and, and I was sitting in, in, a, in a vehicle, a van where there was people next to me and in front of me. And I couldn't pray out loud because they weren't quite saved yet. So I had to pray the whispering kind of prayer. I just prayed in the Spirit, prayed in the Spirit. It wasn't two minutes we came around the corner. There was a car stranded across the road. There was no space on the left or the right to pass. And I was expecting us to T-bone that vehicle, hit it in the center. We had oncoming traffic. You remember America right on the wrong side of the road. And while I was praying the Spirit, 70 miles per hour, or 120 odd plus kilometers per hour, we just go, and we passed. Still traveling at 120 kilometers per hour. In the rain, through the mid-afternoon, or the, the, the afternoon 
main traffic. What happened? I don't know how God did it, but for a split second, he took us from here to there without any injury, without any accident. In the natural, it was impossible. My good friend, Ron Kusmo, had a similar experience. They're traveling up in Africa. They're going around the mountain pass. And the next moment, there is this petrol tanker in front of them. On this side, it's just a, a sheer rock fall on this side. On this side is a mountain edge. You can't go anywhere. Johanna, his late wife, picked her knees up, put her, put her head between her knees, and Ron put his arms across the steering wheel, and they both just shouted the name, Jesus! And when they looked, they were on the other side, and the truck was on that side. How did that happen? Supernatural translation to the other side. We were sharing the same thing this afternoon about another incident. These things are real. Kim Clement himself also shares about when God supernaturally took him from, he was an hour late to get to the airport, and there's no way you can get there on time, and the next moment he was in the airport. Many people have had this experience. What is that? It's supernatural moving from one realm to the other. See, God does not work with time. God works in the now. And so if he decides to take that curtain and just move it a little bit, he can do that. God doesn't work in time. God works in now. Say with me now. now. So because of faith, Enoch was caught up and transferred to heaven so he didn't have a glimpse of death. He was not found because God had translated him. For even before he was taken to heaven, he received a testimony, or it's still on record, that Enoch had pleased God and been satisfactory to God. Say this, I want to please God. So I want to be found satisfactory before God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God or be satisfactory to Him. Certainly, faith is important. Faith is important. Belief is important. Trusting God is important. Amen? For whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists. And that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. You can't go to God with a casual kind of Christianity. Huh? You know, coming home, home to your wife at night, you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Hormonal level is over the peak. She's been taking care of the babies. I mean, she hasn't had time to get herself beautiful. But all you want as, as a male is to get rid of whatever you want to get rid of. She's not in the mood. And believe me, you better get her in the mood. I've had 40 years of experience. Because if you're not in the mood, forget it. Amen. You can't just go and push yourself on God when you want to. Intimacy is, is between two people. Not one person satisfying their lust, their desire, their wants, their prayer requests. Okay, I hope you're listening. But true intimacy with God is when, when you, you create the atmosphere where the aroma is so sweet. Nothing, nothing is more important than you and God at that moment in time. Before you know it, you walk out with that pregnancy, that expectation, which you don't even understand because you just know you've been impregnated. I walk out of this presence of God. I don't know what God did or, or what happened. I just love the moment in worship. I love the moment. The, the, in worship, there comes a moment. Sometimes it's just a moment that you know this was it. And that's when the seed was planted into your spiritual womb, my spiritual womb. And you leave the church and you, don't, you say, wow, you know, you might not even remember the guy who's preaching, don't remember his message, but you just go out, you, you feel satisfied. And you can't explain why. I'll tell you why, because God has impregnated his seed into you. He's put destiny inside of you. A Jewish writer by the name of Jonathan Ben Uziel says this about Enoch. He paraphrases, he says, Enoch worshipped in truth before the Lord. Enoch worshipped in truth before the Lord. 
And behold, he was not with the inhabitants of the earth. Do you know that when you, time when you're in worship with God and praising God, that the people around you don't exist? You're not with the inhabitants anymore. You're now with the angels. You're now, you're now with the throne of God. You're, you're, now with the, you're busy with God. And whoever's around you don't matter. It's like they don't exist. Enoch habitually walked with God. In other words, man, this guy was literally constant in his presence. Some people will say, that child of, man's, my, of mine is crazy. He's always talking to somebody, dreaming these dreams. His invisible friend. No, not crazy. Tapped into the spirit realm. That's what the child has done. Another man says this, the holy blessed God took Enoch, caused him to ascend to the highest heavens, and watch this, and delivered into Enoch's hands all the superior treasures. Wow. What was the key here? This guy worshipped God in spirit, in truth. Because of his faith, a man, a woman that's got faith will worship God, even though they don't have money. Even though it looks like their marriage is falling apart. A man or woman of faith in that storm will find the eye of the storm and worship God. In other words, they can get to a place of peace in their heart. Not understand it with the head, but something says it's going to come out fine. I can't understand it, but I know it's going to work out fine. If you learn to worship Him. This is stuff we know. But man, I never saw it with Enoch. Why would God put the story about Enoch? Enoch walked with God and then he wasn't. Because God is trying to get the message to us, hey guys, there's more. There's much more in the spirit that you can have today, tonight, where you can step into a realm where one word from God, one image from God, one vision from God, one glimpse into the heavenly realm changes your perspective on life. God took me to the third heaven once. And I saw things, which again, you can't explain. But it showed me a lot of people that were covered in blood. They were wounded. Some never had limbs. And my heart was weeping. I entered into the heaviest travail I ever entered in my life. It felt like my chest was going to burst with the agony and the pain that I had while I was praying. And I hear myself screaming out. I saw all these pastors and ministers on my one side who want to heal the sick and raise the dead and, and do these mighty signs, wonders and miracles, and I was weeping, and I hear myself crying out, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, only Holy Spirit can do it. Only Holy Spirit can do it. And I wept as I said it, and I wept as I said it. And I woke up weeping. And then I had a conversation with God. I said, Father, if Holy Spirit is the only one that can do it, what is my part? This is what he said to me. He said, James, you do the prophetic action. And while you're busy doing the prophetic action, pray in tongues, the two combined is the power of God. Not just praying in tongues. But as you act out signing that check for a million rand that you want to sow, or meeting someone's need, as you act it out prophetically, pray in the Spirit, because those two is the power of God that will cause a thing to manifest. Say, I have a part to play. Holy Spirit's the one who does the supernatural, but we do the natural. Hello? So Enoch simply loved to walk with God, talk to God, like his great, 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 great granddad did in the Garden of Eden. They walked with God. He walked with God by faith in the ways of his worship and his service towards God. So when we give tithes and offering and gifts and donations and 
Call it what you want. It's our service towards God. Because God loves people. And he says, if you've got that habitual lifestyle, I'll take you where I am. You can step into the realm where I am, where you can see the angels ministering. You can see how heaven operates. You can see how to bring the supernatural into the natural. You see, we've got to enter that realm before we get the blessing on the earth. That's why we pray. Come to the throne room of grace that you may obtain mercy to find a grace that helps you in the time of need. You're not going to get help unless you pray or someone else prays for you. But without prayer, nothing's going to work. Without worship, what is prayer? Prayer is worshiping God. Prayer is having faith in God. Hello? God you can't feel, God you can't see, God you can't explain. He's invisible, he's an invisible God, you know. You're either crazy or you've got faith. John chapter 4 verse 23, Jesus said a time will come. He says, indeed, it's already here when the true genuine worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Say, that's me. That's me. For the Father is seeking such, just such people as these, as his worshipers. God is a spirit, a spiritual being. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth or in reality. That's why speaking in tongues is so important. And the religious sector of the church has tried to steal that from the body of Christ. Tongues, speaking in tongues is the gift that opens up the other eight. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, gifts of healing, working miracles, the gift of faith. The speaking in tongues opens that up for you. I'm saying that because some of you need to hear that because if you're not full of the Spirit, you need to get full of the Spirit. Get to your pastor, someone in the church, or if you're listening to me or hearing my voice as I'm teaching, go to your church and get full of the Spirit. Say to me, God took him. Why did God take him? One commentary says this, that there to show that there was a better life prepared up ahead. God took him to show the world as a testimony of the immortality of souls and bodies. Already in the Old Testament, God is talking about immoral uh, immorality, immortality. In other words, you don't have to die. Enoch never even tasted death, knew what death was. He was just just so in love with God, worshiping God and fellowship with God. Hey, God, check that nice rose, man. I wish you could smell it, God, but I'm going to smell it for you. You know, be real with God. Talk to God like you talk to a friend. Next moment, zip. Now, I don't think Enoch found that strange because he was working with God all the time. So he just moved on with God. I'm sure God took him into that spirit realm on a regular basis. Over 300 years, I think he had a few experiences. I think so. I hope you're getting something here. Say this, I can, I can experience, experience heaven, heaven on, earth. on earth. I mean, Ezekiel. I mean, you know Ezekiel? Yeah. I mean, that guy had an amazing experience. A lifetime experience. Just give, let me give you an example here. In Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1, he says, I sat in my house with the elders. Where was he? Sitting in the house before the elders. Was he on the earth? Yes. I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me. And then the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. What does that mean? The power of God came on him and caught him up into another realm. They're talking. I mean, have you seen that? Sometimes people talk to you, but they're not there. This happened to this guy, but he saw amazing stuff. 
By the rivers of Babylon. Du, 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 du. Remember Abba's, Abba's song? No, it happened yeah, with this man. He said, yeah, he said that it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river, river Babylon. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. He was sitting by the river. I don't know how many times he sat there, but there was a moment that he gets caught up in the spirit, and he brings this revelation of the angels coming in a whirlwind. He thought it was a whirlwind. And when, the, when he saw the, the detail, he saw these angels with their wings connected and all together, and, and the whole big story, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. What did he do? How can we worship the Lord in a strange country? He was busy worshiping. Enoch was worshiping. Next moment, Enoch's not here, man. Ezekiel was worshiping. Next moment, phew. Although his body's there, his spirit wasn't there. His spirit was somewhere else. He, he, was, he was dreaming big dreams with his eyes open, like many of the South Africans today. How many remember the story of Paul? Come on, guys, I'm putting some stuff in your spirit here. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 to verse 4, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out the body, I do not know. God knows. This man was caught up to the third heaven. I've been there. And I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and he heard utterances beyond the power of man to put into words which man is not permitted to utter. I don't want to go down to that last statement, but the point was this. Paul had a supernatural experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He gets smacked off his horse and he's caught up in the spirit. He talks to Jesus. The people around him heard a voice but don't know what's going on. Paul gets of the biggest revelation of his life in those three days where he's blind. He doesn't see the natural stuff, but he sees Jesus. You see, he got messages from Jesus. He never met Jesus in, in, the, in the natural. Paul met the Christ, the risen Christ. He never met the Jesus of Nazareth walking on the planet. He walked the Christ, the anointed one, in a different form in the spirit. Say to me, spiritual form. Say it again, spiritual form. And then, guys, what about John on the Isle of Patmos? They had tried to kill John over and over and over. They boiled him. They boiled him in oil. The guy couldn't die. Have you ever put some chicken wings in oil and, or some meat in oil and you, and you want to fry it? It just... That's what happened to his body. They couldn't kill him. So then they put him on the, on the aisle and they just left him there. And he says there, what happens to this guy? He says, uh, Revelation 1.9, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, that's an understatement, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos. I was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, his suffering, boiling in the oil, all the stuff he went through for was, was for one reason. It was for him to get on the island and get the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, sometimes we go through hell on earth. And God's got purpose with that. God didn't want John to be boiled in water or, or oil. Are you there? But God had destined John to be on the aisle to come to a place where he's totally dead but alive to Christ. Seventy years down the road after the resurrection of Jesus, he's in the spirit. That's what he says there. I find myself, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. When was the Lord's day? The day of his crucifixion. The day of judgment. The day of Armageddon was the Lord's day. Are you there? Not Sunday. 
and he hears a voice behind him, he turns back, and there's Jesus walking among the candlesticks of the church, the seven churches of Asia. And Jesus was basically saying to John, John, I want you to come up higher, come up here to this realm where I am, where Enoch is, where you can be, and I want to show you things that need to come to pass. Just like you said, Holy Spirit will show you things to come. John, the church doesn't know me. 70 years down the road, they don't know who I am or who I was. So please put your pen down. Write about me. I'll give you the visions, the parables, the images. And once you've written these things, my people will realize. But Jesus said, I am the sheep. Sorry, not the sheep. I'm the shepherd of the sheep. I lay my life down for them. I am the door. Who, who's, who's worthy to open up the seals of the book? Are you with me? Everything in the book of Revelation is found in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, and in the Gospels. Everything. Because the book of Revelation is the revealing, the revelation of Christ when he walked the planet or what was prophesied over him from Genesis chapter 1. It's not a book of future events. It's a book of history. Looking back to the cross and beyond. If you read it that way, it'll make sense to you. But if you're going to read it from this side, looking forward to Jerusalem and what they want to build, the temple and the mark of the beast and the, the 666, and if, if you're going to look at it that way, you're going to follow Satan's kingdom. And you choose. It's not the revealing of the Antichrist. It's the revealing of Christ. John got that. He didn't ask for it. He just happened to be there. God says, Zip, you love me so much? Come, let me show you some stuff. He had the habitual, con consistent, continuous worship, fellowship with God on a personal level. Say this, Holy Spirit is the one who transports me into the spirit realm. The other day, a, a spirit medium came into my church, young, young lady, Afrikaans school, and she wanted to know what's wrong with what she's doing in my church service. I've called out, in fact, and I put it, put it in front. And she says to me, you know, Pastor, I help people. I, um, I also pray over them, and although I use the Ouija boards, and, 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 and. What's wrong with it? And I said, nothing. I said, magic, fortune-telling, witchcraft. That was there long before Jesus even came on the planet. I mean, it might shock you, but Daniel and those guys and the sorcerers work together. You see? But I said to him, ma'am, you know that the way that these people operated and, and, and you operate is by what we call a familiar spirit. That spirit's familiar with a lot of things. Can mimic your dead grandmother or father or brother or sister or child or whatever. Because they know everything about them because in the spirit realm they know a lot of stuff. I said, however, didn't you give your life to Jesus? Aren't you saved and born again? She said, yes, I am. I said, well, you and I should be operating by the Holy Spirit's ministry. Would you like to operate the correct way? And she said, I would like to. I said, great. I said, let me pray for you. I looked into her eyes and I simply said, spirit of divination, come out in Jesus' name. There was no screaming. No demons manifesting, just love and tears. Tears just started streaming down her face. She was seeking truth. She found it in love. 
accusation and judgment and condemnation or wanting to have a fight. She just received the love of God, totally set free from that spirit, came to my, my church so hungry for God over the next number of weeks. The power of God hit her and her boyfriend. I, I, this is so funny. I've never been into drugs. I don't know drugs at all. But this youngster said to me, Pastor, Pastor, I've been on drugs, man. I know what drugs is, but I've never been on a high like I've been on tonight. Amen. A genuine from a young, young guy. I can't relate to that because I, I don't know that. God transformed her life through the ministry of love. You need to hear that because you can be called as a prophet and you can operate with a sharp sword that hurts instead of doing laser beam surgery. Basically, I'm saying to all of us, let's learn to focus on God and get out of the, the, the natural realm more often and, and focus on God and not stuff around us. Psalm 27 verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to be in that realm all, all the time. I don't know how many times I've said it in, in, in my years of ministry. I said, I would rather be alone in my prayer closet than be on the platform and preaching to people. If God chose me to do what I, I'm doing. So I do what he's told me to do. But one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek. I'll seek that, that desire. When God puts a desire in you, run after the desire. that I may dwell in the house of the Lord or in His presence all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. I think all of us want that. I want it, you want it, we all want it. In Psalm 37, 4 says this, Delight yourself also in the Lord. And He shall give you the desires of your heart. Lord, I delight myself in you. I love you so much. You're so wonderful. You're so awesome. You're so faithful. In all the years that I know God, I've summed this up. If I can describe God in one word, I would say to God in my life, in my family's life, I'd say faithful. God, you're faithful. And you know what? He likes to hear that. You know, like the wife, my wife has taught me how to love her. Or express love to you because I come out of a very hard family. Never knew how to love, how to express love. You see, when I go to a funeral, this is how it used to be, I'll say congratulations. <laughs> I'd have the wrong words. I, I, I didn't know how to work, how do I release compassion for this person? Because I wasn't taught how to love. Hello? My father never had a father because of the First World War and the way we were raised up. Are you there? So my daughter got the brunt of the natural repsols and not the transformed repsol, the Christ life. So she had to take the brunt of what the natural gives. And then how many times in life I apologized to when she was a little girl? When I used to get angry and hit the table and, and the plates and stuff would just fall off the table and there would be fear in the house and anger in the house. And my daughter would run out and cry outside. I find myself going to her and going on my knees and say, Beverly, would you please forgive Daddy? I hugged my father the first time in 1982, just before he died. I had the privilege of putting my arms around my dad. Because we never knew love. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us love. Didn't know how to express it. So my wife was quite good at it, and uh, every lady will agree with me. You want to hear these words. I love you. I love you. And I tell my wife, you know I love you. So I say, ek wil dit wer. I must hear it. But you know, I, no, I want to hear, 
Please say you love me. I don't know if the women are just insecure or something, but you know, us men are men, you know. No, because that's the way the, the women are wired. They want to hear the words. I love you. Men are just moved by what they see. Hmm. That's true. Say this, if I delight myself in the Lord, focus more on Him, He's going to give me the desires of my heart. Now, just, t- just tie that up with one of the most famous scriptures on faith. Have faith in God. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes the things he says will come to pass, he'll have what he says. Therefore, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have it. What things you desire at your time of prayer will manifest. You don't come with a prayer request into prayer and thinking God's going to answer that prayer request. He answers the desires of your heart when you're in intimacy with Him. Please catch this. It's going to help you. You might feel, oh God, I need, I need, I need money right now to deliver me out of this, this debt situation. And when you find you're having intimacy with God, He talks about something totally different to you. And that is the solution to your problem, not the money. Could be unforgiveness, be merciful, or whatever. But the moment you're in His presence, desires come up into your heart. That's the word of the Lord that you confess. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, what am I supposed to say? The word that you get when you pray. When the desire comes up in your heart, that's the word you must speak to your mountain. That's the word that's going to give you success. Not the word that you just take scriptures and confess scriptures. It's the word you get while you're in intimacy with God. Say this, I need to seek my happiness in God. See, it's in His being, it's in His, it's in his perfections, in His friendship, His love. You see, there's no one who can love us more than what God can. He's the example. There's a cross, there's a cross. There's an image of Christ on the cross. There's love personified. Christ on the cross. And if you can understand the Christ that's crucified, that's why Paul said, I only want to preach Christ crucified, not Christ resurrected. Because if you understand the crucifixion, you're going to understand the love. Other stuff would make more sense to you. Christ crucified that I might live. I hope this made sense tonight. But I I believe there's strong revelation in it. You can and I can be like Enoch if we are consistent with our fellowship with God, in our worship of God, in talking with Him, asking Him questions, talking about issues. The more you start doing that, desires will come up and you find yourself into a realm that you want to get into more often. Because there is safety. There is protection. There is power and miracles. You've got to get there first in the glory, and out of the glory, you minister those things. Amen. Hi, my name is Pastor Johan Mankies from Zoe Ministries, South Africa, here in Rudderport. I just want to say thank you for, for watching this message. Now we really pray that God has touched you, He has encouraged you, He has uplifted you in Jesus' name. Also, I want to say to you, if you've never made Jesus your Lord, it is very simple. All that you say is, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and I believe and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Very simple. Then you are saved. If you want more information about myself and about our ministry, please do not hesitate to visit our website and see what we're all about and what we have to offer. So I just want to say bless you again and thank you again for watching this awesome message. Amen. Bless you.